Good, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I, and welcome to this uh, session. I hope you have enjoyed the morning uh, of uh, the first day of the Sustainable uh, Energy Week um, discussions, the plenary session, the award ceremony, uh, the, uh, the, the, the debate with the EUCF um, digital ambassadors from different sectors this morning. My name is Silvia Rezeshi. I'm a policy officer at Directorate General Energy of the European Commission, working on energy performance of buildings. And today I'm stepping in for my head of unit, Stefan Moser, who uh, has been taken away by the ongoing technical work on uh, the negotiations of the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. Um, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here in the room and uh, online. Uh, to, the, to the afternoon of, uh, of day one of the Sustainable Energy Week, and in particular to this session uh, that will discuss how to, uh, to address the workforce shortage and the skills gap that, is, uh, that are becoming a bottleneck or risking to become a bottleneck uh, to the transition, uh, to the clean energy transition in general, but in particular to the transition to climate neutral buildings. Uh, I'm sure that we will all, all um, agree that the building decarbonization uh, agenda has already created a, uh, an ever-growing market expectation uh, for in the context of renovation. Um, in addition, the recent unprecedented energy price volatility and energy security concerns have highlighted the urgency and the importance of, of the clean energy transition in which the buildings uh, do play a central role and the decarbonization in, uh, of buildings do play a central role. Um, higher renovation rates and higher standards uh, for new constructions have, uh, have a multiplier effect on jobs and growth in the construction sector um, and across the, the whole uh, building renovation value chain. We have the technologies, we have been mobilizing a growing uh, so source of public and private financing. Uh, so the question remains, do we have the most important element in this equation? Do we have the necessary, the necessary skilled workforce? And today, uh, the discussion is about this. We have uh, a list of experts that bring and that will bridge, uh, hopefully, a decade long, decades long, uh, knowledge, experience, and uh, vision on the topic of skills in general and skills for building decarbonization in particular. We, I, I, I believe that uh, this, um, uh, that the discussion will benefit from the complementarity of their perspectives. We have uh, the perspectives of the public authorities at European and also regional and local level. We have uh, in different policy domains in the domain of energy, as well as employment policy and the internal market. We have the perspective uh, of the construction and heating industries, as well as very importantly, the perspective of uh, training and educational providers. Um, and we are very pleased to start today's discussion with an opening state statement by um, Ms. Paula Pino, who is uh, director uh, at the Directorate General Energy. Um, of the European Commission responsible for just transition consumers, energy efficiency and innovation and energy security. Uh, Ms. Pino draws on her extensive knowledge of various EU policies and in particular energy, uh, EU energy policy, as well as her leadership, negotiation skills and true commitment to Europe's clean and um, just energy transition and energy security. The floor is yours. Thank you, Silvia, and good afternoon, everyone. A real pleasure to be here uh, with you, and uh, we're all together in an intense and challenging journey, the one of decarbonizing our building stock. Uh, we can expect an exciting uh, journey indeed, uh, with some challenges to overcome. In fact, if we want to deliver on our 2050 climate neutrality ambition, this means a massive uh, renovation of the building stock as carbon emissions from buildings alone need to go down by 66 zero percent by 2030. Now we are setting up the necessary conditions to make this happen. Sylvia just mentioned the EPBD, our teams with the parliament, with the council are sitting together to advance the discussions, the negotiations on the European Performance of Buildings Directive, which is absolutely key uh, in, this, in this journey. 
we are working on the secondary legislation, such as uh, 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 covering appliances, uh, space uh, heaters, for instance, uh, which, uh, by the way, has already been picked up in some uh, national press, uh, not always in the best reflecting uh, terms. So it shows you how uh, challenging also politically this journey uh, can be and the need to set the record uh, straight. So we have the regulatory framework on which we are now, as we speak, currently working. We have unprecedented financial means, and I'm thinking, for instance, of the recovery and resilience funds, where from the 37%, which is earmarked alone for energy and climate uh, projects, the biggest chunk is going into renovation, into energy efficiency, and we're seeing it, how member states are putting together plans, uh, recovering resilience plans, addressing the, the so much needed renovation. So this is an opportunity which absolutely needs to be seized. We are in the process of establishing a heat pump action plan with clear actions, which also cover uh, the subject of today, skills. And we are working on the research and innovation so as to make sure that we indeed have the technologies which are necessary to embark and deliver uh, on this uh, uh, journey. But with all these elements in place, there is one key enabler that we risk missing and where everything would go down the, rain, the, the, the drain, all our efforts, and that is precisely the skills. We may have the best policy in place, the best legislation, the financial means, and if we lack those people to actually implement it on the ground, then we can forget about it. So it's essential that we put our uh, thoughts and action into addressing uh, the, the skills. It's no coincidence that 2023 is the European uh, Year of Skills because this is an issue that we are seeing structurally. It doesn't just concern buildings. It concerns, in a, in, in a way, very much all, all the industry that is needed and all the workforce that is needed to actually carry out the decarbonization of an, our energy system. Now, if we look into uh, specifically the, the uh, workforce uh, in these areas. The construction sector employs up to 10% of the EU workforce, and more than 95% of companies are SMEs. Now, our ability to deliver on the climate neutrality ambition only goes as far and as fast as our skilled workers uh, can take us. And if we look at the employment uh, forecasts, and we have colleagues here in the panel representing DG employment, it highlights the increased demand for labor in sectors such as the construction sector that are already facing labor shortages, uh, which is due to a range of, of factors uh, linked to workforce aging, to uh, sometimes poor working conditions, the lack of specific skills. At the same time, productivity has been stagnating, and we sometimes uh, uh, miss the motivation to, to innovate. Now, as a result, and especially with the accelerated pace of the energy transition, the lack of sufficient uh, workforce uh, with relevant skill sets, both traditional and new skill sets, so it's not just we need, that we need new, also the traditional uh, skills are uh, 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 missing. And in the new skill set, so I could mention uh, digitalization, I could mention system optimization. So this is increasingly pointed as um, a big growing bottleneck in the clean energy uh, transition. We estimate that by 2030, which basically is this evening, as much as three to four million additional workers in the construction sector need to undergo training and develop the skills needed to achieve climate neutrality and building renovation is, of course, in the core of this. And I was reading just this morning in the press that in the UK, the, 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 the problem is, is the same. And when faced with the possibility of having a training, skilled workforce, but on the traditional uh, means, say, why would I give three days of my time to train myself when actually I can, I'm busy enough uh, to use those days to actually continue to install, for instance, uh, gas boilers uh, throughout uh, Europe. So it's a real uh, issue. So this is only part of the picture, in fact. Recent industry e uh, estimates point to a need for additional 750,000 installers in 2030 and for reskilling at least 
50, 50 percent of existing in, in installers in order to deliver the Repower EU plan objective of doubling the deployment rates of heat pumps. And of course, I'm not even speaking of the materials and the supply chains, which is another issue, but we have enough to deal with uh, uh, here. Now, we have uh, fortunately already a number of uh, uh, inspiring examples across the EU where the skills, uh, the required skills are being promoted. And where, for instance, it's about coordinating education, training, upskilling, reskilling efforts for uh, take, for instance, but it's not the only one, heat pump installers also engaging locally, regionally uh, with the authorities in the skills required for the energy transition um, uh, agenda. There are industry academies that are integrating the knowledge uh, and they are providing it in innovative formats. There is the so-called Build Up Skills Initiative, which is managed by CINEA, which is co-organizing this session uh, with us in DG Energy, and which since 2011 supported more than 90 projects that have developed and tested innovative solutions to bridge the skills gap in the building sector. Several EU funds are being used towards um, uh, developing the necessary skills. I mentioned the recovery and resilience plans, uh, funds. There's also a la long-standing priority for the EU co cohesion policy. Uh, there's the European Social Fund Plus, REACT EU, the Just Transition Fund, uh, even Erasmus Plus is also being geared towards providing for the necessary uh, 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 skills. Uh, and to go more in depth into the Just Transition Fund, for instance, member states have allocated over 218 million to ensure that skills for smart specialization and industrial transition and almost 200 million for labor market matching and transitions uh, 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 is, uh, is uh, deployed. Also the life clean energy transition uh, is, uh, is uh, about to have a call in 2023 about 100 million euros and this call is now open, it will be closing mid uh, November, and it covers a range of policy-driven topics around buildings, energy performance, renovation, one-stop shops, uh, workforce upskilling, so worth looking into it for those who may be uh, interested. Now, all of these and these funds, as, as, as good as it may sound, are definitely not enough. And we do need, uh, really, the cooperation across all sectors and the contribution from both private and uh, uh, from both public and private uh, sectors. And here, I, I, I keep reiterating this, for those of you who heard me before, will hear it again, industry plays a key role. And it's really important to join forces on skilling and reskilling, including among competitors, I'm sorry to say, may be strange, but including among competitors to pool resources and to train the necessary workforce to deploy it and so that we really can bridge this uh, challenge. It should not fail uh, under the, the lack of, uh, uh, of, of appropriate workforce. Uh, we had a number of challenges to overcome. We're doing it. I'm confident that all together we will be also able to train and skill the necessary workforce that we need for this energy uh, transition. And this is what is being discussed and with this excellent panel. I would have loved to, to stay, but I'm still traveling uh, now in the afternoon, so I'll have to, to leave. But uh, uh, thank you for all the panelists and look forward to hearing from your discussion today. Thank you, Silvia. Thank you very much, Paula. Thank you very much, uh, Paola, for this uh, very informative statement and for opening the session on a, on a positive note. We do need it for the discussion, uh, while at the same time also uh, pointing to the need to, to accelerate, align efforts uh, in view of developing and very impo importantly deploying uh, what it takes to, to accelerate the skills uh, agenda for clean energy transition. Thank you very much. Um, so I, um, I hope that uh, as the next, uh, next stop on our journey is our panelists who will bring more insights, inspirations and, and vision from initiatives that they have, uh, that, that they have uh, promoted, they have participated, put together and or initiatives that they would like to see in the future. 
Um, so um, just a few uh, housekeeping announcements. I, will sh I shall be I shall proceed with shortly introducing our uh, six excellent panelists, uh, and then each of them will proceed with a short introductory statement. Uh, you were invited to to raise uh, your questions uh, during their uh, presentation, uh, their introduction, uh, or after that, but exclusively using Slido. And here is the event code. Uh, regardless whether you are online or in the room, the, the, the gray microphones don't work. So please do use Slido. And then we will be showing the, uh, the questions for discussion on the screen, uh, on the screens here in the room and uh, on your uh, monitors online. Um, so, um, let me move to presenting our uh, panel. First, we have uh, we'll have uh, Mr. Felix Ron, who is policy officer at uh, Director General Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion of the European Commission. Then we will have Mr. Philip Mosley, uh, who is a policy officer from uh, the Director General for Internal Market, Industry, Entrepreneurship and SMEs of the European Commission. Philip. Um, then we will have uh, Mrs. Uh, Christiane Egger, who is uh, deputy manager at uh, Energie uh, Sparverband Öster Uber Österreich, uh, which is the regional uh, <laughs> energy agency of Upper Austria. Um, and then we move to the almost by chance to the other side of uh, of our table round table that is not round of our panel. <laughs> Uh, where we have uh, Mrs. Federica Sabati, who is the Secretary General of the European Heating Industry, uh, Mr. Fernando Sikchos, who is the Secretary General of the European Builders uh, Confederation, and last but by no means least, uh, Mr. Uh, Jan Kromwijk, uh, who is Project Coordinator at ISSO, the Dutch Knowledge Center of the Building and Building Services Industries. So uh, the floor is yours. Ladies <laughs> first. <laughs> well, <clears throat> okay. Um, I work um, since 2002 in uh, education and training, um, but there was a moment when we understood that our projects, some of you might know the Leonardo da Vinci program, uh, that projects that are sector-based, that are implemented uh, by the same sector, that these projects had um, a more chance of uh, being sustained so that the results uh, continue to be used over the EU funding uh, period. And um, from that on, we decided we have to create a special project type for this at the time it was the Sector Skills Alliances that had a very good take up. It was in the Erasmus program, Erasmus Plus program. And this uh, a little plan grew and grew. And here we come to DG Grow because DG Grow is responsible for many sectors, industrial sectors. And they said, uh, we love this action. Can we make it bigger? And um, then the directors agreed to DG Employment Director, DG Grow Director agreed, we make it big, we make it the blueprint alliances for sectoral um, uh, cooperation on, on skills. And um, again, this was quite a success. And um, I don't know, maybe not everybody has heard in the room of the Pact for Skills, which is an action uh, of the European Skills Agenda from 2020. Uh, in fact, uh, the Pact for Skills was modeled uh, on on the blueprint alliances. So always this approach, let sectors work together, but also across, because uh, for example, energy efficiency is certainly something which is rather cross-cutting. So um, sometimes also different sectors uh, can work together uh, on the same subject. Yes, last but not least, I mentioned the Pact for Skills. I mentioned the European Skills Agenda. I did not mention the 12 actions under it, but that is then not introductory anymore. Um, these will feature prominently in the European Year of Skills, because we have the European Year of Skills since the 9th of May, and it will go until next year, 8th, um, 8th May, of course. Yeah. yeah, and with this, I close for the moment. 
Thank you very much, Felix. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here. I'm uh, Philippe Mosley, pol uh, policy officer at uh, DG Grow, uh, which is, the, as we heard, the DG for the internal market and, and industry. And, and there I'm working in the construction unit, so we're responsible for policies dealing with the competitiveness of uh, the construction industry. And obviously, uh, skills is, is very much part of, of keeping the industry competitive. Um, we heard uh, Ms. Pino point out some of the uh, importance of construction and its size. Uh, what we have under the uh, EU industrial strategy is we have set out 14 industry ecosystems and construction is actually the second biggest uh, ecosystem in Europe, in both in employment terms and in economic terms. So we're talking about around 25 million jobs and more than 5 million companies. And uh, of course, majority SMEs, but not only that, and I think it's an important point when it comes to skills, is that most of those SMEs are micro enterprises. And that severely uh, impacts then their capacity to invest in skills, in technology, uh, uh, and so on. So, so that is always at the front of our minds when we talk about skills in, in construction and when we deal with uh, other policies to, uh, dealing with construction. So, so this human capital is a critical factor uh, and companies have already been, as we heard, reporting a lack of, of skilled labor uh, and we need a new generation of um, skilled workers and, and talent for the, for the longer term. Um, what in, uh, in terms of skills for construction, the member states are really in a driving seat and an important uh, position that they can play because they control uh, employment schemes, uh, educational schemes, and they control building regulations as well. So they, they are in a, um, a very strong position to, uh, to take action, and it's good to see um, many of them in their recovery and resilience plans uh, you know, taking action on, on building renovation to decarbonize and so on. But industry can also play its part. And um, what we can see with, uh, we, we heard examples from Ms. Pino about the importance of uh, installation of, of renewable energy technologies like heat pumps and solar panels and so on. And quite often the manufacturers uh, can upskill their own installers workforce. So they, they can also help in that sense. So it's not only about um, you know, policy action, either at EU level or, or member state level, it's also about what industry can do. And what we've been doing at, at DG Grow uh, for the construction ecosystem is we've developed uh, a transition pathway for construction. In line with the industrial strategy, all of these ecosystems are doing these transition pathways. And this is about um, the digital transition, the green transition, and also improving the resilience of, of construction. And uh, in this transition pathway, um, it contains a number of recommendations for action, uh, including on skills. And uh, so it's well worth looking at those because the transition pathway was developed together with industry and the member states in a, in a co-creation process. So there's really a, um, a vision in the transition pathway of, of what we need to do to undergo, to help the industry undergo this transition because if we're to decarbonize the building stock, the construction industry itself also needs to undergo uh, a transition. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there for, for the messages from DG Grow, but uh, I'll be looking forward to an interesting debate. Thanks. Thank you, Philip. Okay, good afternoon. Um, so as was said, my name is Christiane Ecker. Uh, maybe I explain who I am. <laughs> it's not so straightforward. As with the commission, I work uh, for one of the 315 regional and local energy agencies in Europe. In case you haven't come across us, we are the ones who drive the energy transition in our regions and cities uh, and do it with a lot of skills, if I may say this here in this room. Um, in my region, not only thanks to the agency, but uh, with our help, we managed to reduce GHG emissions in buildings uh, by over a third in the last decade. 
Uh, and half of this reduction came from energy efficiency and half from renewables. At first, I didn't believe it, so this is too, but it is, in fact, the face. The case, so in terms of renewable heating, we use a portfolio of solutions, which is heat pumps, which is uh, clean bioenergy, and which is high efficiency district heating. And to tie on what to Paula's remarks on the heating industry, uh, we have seen, especially in the debate in Germany about heat pumps, uh, if you prescribe one solution, you are quite open to populists. And I think this is maybe also something to take back uh, into our debate. Now, uh, we use a policy approach that we call the carrots, the sticks, and the tambourines. And so the carrots and the sticks are obvious. Carrots is funding, uh, sticks is regulatory instruments, uh, and the tambourine is what people surprisingly now discover is of equal importance. It's the information, the awareness raising, and the training. To us, working on regional and local level, it's always been obvious that without people being aware, without people being understanding, without people being having the right skills, we can mo not move forward. And how do we drive skills now specifically? I would say there are two approaches. One is, and in my opinion, it's maybe the stronger one, it's the indirect. So as uh, was mentioned, uh, the installer, the construction company, have to, has too much work anyway. So, but if the first consumer asks for a solution, they say, no, no, we don't have this. If the second asks. So uh, we try to educate consumers. We do 10,000 face-to-face energy advice sessions every year. And this is a very strong driver to change the market, make people ask for it. We have a long track record for a range of technologies where this has worked extremely, extremely well. So another demand side measure is ambitious criteria and funding programs. And so if funding program ask for um, high efficiency heat pumps uh, with low noise levels, people want this funding. So the installer has to learn it, whether they like it or not. Um, of course, we check also these. <laughs> so this is also part of the stick. Um, but I think there are quite a lot of elements in the, in the stick and in the carrot that can also drive uh, skills. And then once we have people ready to be skilled, uh, there are many other measures. Uh, we have a wide training offer. Austria is luckily one of these countries where they, we have uh, apprenticeship, so these kind of dual trainings uh, where people learn to be an installer, an electrician, a construction professional, partly in a company that also has get upskilled in order to be allowed to train apprenticeships and vocational schools. We, have, we work with these vocational schools and already in 1991, we introduced with our educational schools for installers a program dedicated for renewable heating. And now this is part of the normal curriculum. At that time, it was something to opt for, but now it's part of the curriculum. Uh, so they are, then we offer in our own Energy Academy lots of training courses. But again, this would not work without the market push. And we live in an aging population. And we, in my country, we have full employment. So people have enough work to do. So we need other impulses that are strong enough uh, to uh, get people to take up a well-designed, practical, short-term training offer. Thank you very much, Christian. Shall I go? Yes, please. So, good afternoon. Federica Sabati, I'm working for the European heating industry. Those guys that you've all been talking about somehow in, uh, in, uh, in your opening statements that are perhaps doing something to help uh, the, the, uh, the, the training of installers. I think um, to open, actually, I would like to say this is the first time that we have such an inclusive word, so the, the word skills so inclusively across 
you know, the whole of, uh, of this program, but also across a number of the policies that are coming out uh, on energy efficiency, on renewables um, in, in Europe. And this is not only good, it's obviously necessary, but it's also uh, an opportunity. And it's quite a, you know, working on skills, um, building skills is actually quite a strategic issue um, for the EU. Uh, for uh, our industry, but also for our society, because you know technology is one thing, and of course we are focusing a lot about which technologies and how we transform the old technologies into the new technologies. But without people, we cannot actually do that. Um, and so it's very much strategic uh, for us to invest in skills um, and uh, both to be effective in the energy transition of buildings. Uh, but also to keep our uh, competitiveness as industry and uh, as, as society, as, as, as Europe. Um, when we talk about uh, heating specifically, and I suspect then for the broad construction industry it's similar, but th th there will be some differences, but I think the, the, the direction is the same. We are facing uh, we are facing two problems, with our, which are also two opportunities. The first one is uh, to increase the number of workers of labor of talents that are working in the sector of construction so heating both at manufacturing level uh, but very much also at installers level and i'll get to that uh, in a second um, and also um, to reskill those that are already present we count we estimate as as industry that only in the installation of heating systems profession there's about 1.5 million people employed today in europe and uh, yeah, Paola was mentioning earlier, the, the estimates that we give for the future are that in order to reach the goals that we have set for ourselves as European Union for 2030, if we're looking at repower EU, so increasing, for example, heat pumps uh, deployment in the market, where we will need to reskill half of those and uh, find uh, another 50% of those. This is just to uh, reach the 2030 goals looked uh, from the side of Repower EU, which I remember is calling for or is putting the target of 30 million new heat pumps uh, deployed in the European market, uh, which is huge. Last year, we were super happy as manufacturers of heating systems of, of heat pumps to install 1.5 million, 1 1.5. Um, and, and there is 100 and about five, 105 million heating systems installed in Europe. So obviously, uh, it's a big challenge. It's also not the only technology that we will need to train our installers for. We will need more, uh, like you were saying, that whether it's solar uh, systems, uh, whether it's biomass for where it is more relevant, uh, whether it's all types of renewable-based uh, uh, heating systems. So the, the challenge is good. It's also a big opportunity. Um, because not every country in Europe has uh, employment zero. So I think this is uh, an opportunity. It's actually an opportunity that we see when we attract, when we want to attract new uh, talents. To, it's an opportunity to empower those that are specifically calling, that have been specifically calling for uh, you know, an energy transition, an uh, ecological transition. Uh, and I'm talking obviously about young people. And uh, this is really, you know, giving them the instruments, the tools to be action, you know, to be uh, actors of uh, of the transition that that they are calling together with the with the rest. And of course, now the, you know, I think on this we all agree. Uh, who does what? That's really the problem, I think. And it's not a problem of not knowing necessarily what to do. It's a problem of coordination, I think, because industry. Uh, our industry is at the moment training and has been training for a long time a lot of installers. I would even say that pretty much all of the installers that are working today in, you know, in Europe have been trained by some one or the other uh, of, the, of our manufacturers. Um, just last year, to give some more numbers, we uh, trained some 250,000, retrained them. Yeah, so installers existing, we retrain them, and we are we are set to uh, to train three hundred and forty thousand next year. So we are investing in more and more of uh, of the trainings, and we're doing it, you know, innovating in different ways. You know, whether it's in person trainings, online, and mixture using artificial intelligence where we can, where it's already uh, moving forwards, doing roadshows to reach 
the installers where they are, because of course, as was mentioned before, installers particularly are small uh, sized companies that either work or train, go on a training. So you need to really make sure that you're going in their direction. Um, and so we are looking at, yeah, what kind of cooperation can we have with the public administrations? Because uh, this, we, we, we can only go so far. And I think uh, there is a lot that we can do together or that in parallel, which ranges from changing the curricula, updating the curricula of those that will be in the future uh, installers or you know technicians uh, working in in the field of of the building sector, upgrading their their, their curricula, uh, attracting new ones, um, working also more specifically in every country at the assess at the assessment of how many we will actually need and uh, and to, to do what, um, and then uh, and this is more of a political topic. Also looking at, in the short term, do we need to change our migration policies to attract new people from outside the European Union to deal with the speed and the size of, of, of the challenge that we are faced today? A lot of manufacturers are already calling for that, and I think this is an interesting topic um, that you know, crosses everything. So I think never before I have seen you know, buildings, regulations, uh, touching skills, touching security policy, touching you know, migration issues. So I think it's become very much horizontal. Uh, it's, it's a challenge, but it's also a, an enormous opportunity that we have for, uh, for Europe. Thank you very much, Federica. Who would like to? Good afternoon, everyone. Oops. Yes, hello. Um, very difficult for me to, to pursue because many of the points I wanted to raise were mentioned, but that's good. It means we're on the, on the, on the right arguments here. Uh, my name is Fernando Sichos Jimenez. I'm the Secretary General of the European Builders Confederation, EBC. EBC is the European organization representing national associations of construction crafts and SMEs. Um, as you heard before from Philip um, and also Mrs. Uh, Pino, 95% of the companies in construction are not SMEs but micro companies. We are talking people with less than, uh, we're talking companies with less than 10 people. So we're really talking about those companies that operate at a local level, so local economic operators, um, that usually are extremely important for the economy and society at a very local, regional level instead that national or European. Um, and I, I, another definition for those people is the hands-on people that are going to repair your windows, to repair your walls, that are going to check that your electricity is fine, that is going to paint your walls. So people that you're going to come across on a daily basis almost. And something that is true also, it was mentioned, is that um, I started working for ABC 10 years ago. And at the time, uh, one of the uh, claims was that the economic importance of construction wasn't enoughly considered at the political level. Ten years after that is the other way around. Now the political attention on construction, because many people, including our construction companies, realize of the environmental responsibility, the societal uh, responsibility that is also uh, coming from construction, we switch a bit the, 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 um, the focus on construction and now, as Federica was saying, um, many, many um, legislative files, many, many initiatives are actually touching upon buildings, up in the construction sector, because we realize that for any environmental ambition that the European Union has, we need the construction sector to be there, and we need the construction SMEs, micro companies, to be there and embark on the green transition journey. Okay, that's the situation where, that we have now. But then there are several elements that are also coming uh, from the history of our sector. When you think of construction, what is the first image that comes to you? I'm pretty sure it's not going to be a positive one. Uh, we're coming from a, from a sector that is considered male-oriented, heavy tasks, repetitive, burdensome tasks, um, let's say very conservative, which to some extent is true, but also, as we are discussing now, there are many evolutions in, in the sector that indeed we need to turn into opportunities instead of challenges to change the image of the sector. One of those being indeed this green transition, which yes, um, brings new perspectives, uh, a new narrative, 
but also um, creates a double pressure on construction because skills is not a, a pressing issue in the context of the green transition only. Construction has always been facing uh, problems in order to attract people, retain them, reskill them. So now the situation is that small construction companies, in addition to keep their historic struggle to attract people, more people, also need to face this necessity to have those people better trained and equipped with more skills than usually uh, was, I mean, that they were usually trained in the past. So this is a lot for small companies to, to deal with, but we understand that this is part of, uh, of the future of our industry. Um, three elements that um, I would like for you to keep in mind in the conversation here is that, yes, it was mentioned, um, education training is a national competence. Um, in that sense, one actor that could be interesting also to have around this table is a representative of national governments. Why? Because I'm pretty sure you have noticed that the consideration for vocational training, for manual trades, is not the same across Europe. And this is because every member state has, um, let's say, a strategy or a different opinion of how vocational training has to be uh, structured at national level. If you're familiar with Belgium, at the communitaire level, at the region level, at the local level. So we're talking any other level than the European one. Being Belgian myself, in Belgium, vocational training is the last resort educational option. And this is not the case in Germany, for example, where the masters are economic operators that are very well considered because of their um, manual trade expertise. Uh, so here again, this is a conversation that we need to have because a lot, a lot, as uh, a lot depends on um, the national education programs. A second one is a more societ societal um, argument um, because yes, governments can, can do something. Here at the European level, we have discussions on how to help uh, improve things, but also there is homework at home. Um, I was saying that. Um, vocational training might be perceived as a last educational option, also because parents, society, doesn't consider um, manual trades, construction trades, as one way for their children to make a life of, to have a career. And indeed, construction is changing a lot. Um, you, it is a sector where you can become an entrepreneur very quickly, if you have the competences and the willingness to do so. You have a lot of demands, so market, unless you're very bad at it, should be uh, good enough for you to develop a, a, a business. And indeed, it's evolving so fast that you're learning a lot and contributing to society. We will we'll always need buildings, houses, schools, hospitals. So there is a lot of branding that we could do to change the image of construction. And I think this is something that is the work of us as UBC, indeed, but also the work of everyone in, in society. And then, and I will finish with that, uh, construction is a very unique sector. Why? Our products are not moving. We are moving to the product. This is already one thing that usually um, defines the sector. Second one, we have very long and contracting chains. So you have a lot of economic operators working together in order to deliver on a project. Only those make us, let's say, a bit an exceptional sector. Great. And in that sector, again, 95% are micro companies. If those micro companies are not convinced, are not taken as the norm, or uh, how changes has, have to be made in order to make training evolve, if they're not convinced, as it was said uh, earlier, for a construction company of 10 people to have two people going to a vet school for two or three days of training instead of being on a construction site, it means having only 80% of your workforce for a week. It means losing a lot. We're not talking here about a big company that could have that uh, structure where one department can compensate for another one. It's very difficult, so we need training that fits their needs. So as long as we don't convince them, and believe us, uh, believe me, sorry, uh, we are fully, fully embarked on this sustainability uh, trajectory that, that we actually need, not only as the, for the construction sector, but for the whole European Union, as long as we don't convince them with tips, tricks, 
carrot sticks, tambourines, how to better engage with VED representatives, how to better engage uh, with um, other parts of the industry, and how to better engage with public authorities. In construction, it will be very difficult to create a skills revolution. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm uh, delighted to be here, and uh, especially because I had the honor to be in Build Up Skills Initiative since the start from 2011. And that means that we can see how the transition is evolving. Because the transition is something that takes a period of time to come from one state to another state. And that means that in between those two points, a lot of things are happening. And what we see in the Build Up Skills initiatives is that the and they are calling it rightly a wave, the renovation wave is building up power. And if you take the wave as an image, and not looking for a small wave, but a really, really, really strong big wave, when you are lucky, then you can see a band of servers that are serving the power of the wave. And that is the challenge we have as Europe to make sure that there are people that want to serve the renovation wave. And how can that be done? That can be done by making clear what are the wave dynamics. Because there are already servers available in Europe, many of them, transition makers. Circularity, it's an important topic. It's still fairly small, but the expertise needed, there is an abundance of expertise already. The same for heat pump, although it's 1%, growing to 30% or more is not difficult because the skills and the experience is already available in the sector, although we have one challenge. Most of the people are not at the beach, they are at the work site. And that's not only for the skilled craftsmen and the professionals, but especially for the entrepreneurs. And what I see is that many, many entrepreneurs are struggling with the high demand for relatively traditional skills. And then when you come for a new skill, then the answer is quite easy. No, not at this time. Or I will try it, but not with my full dedication, because I have a lot of other business to attend to. And that's why I would like to find out how we can play music at the beach to make sure that they see the big wave coming with the surface on it. And as it is a transition, we also need to took time into perspective because the wave is building up power. And every big wave starts small. Every transition starts small. In fact, transitions are built up about from many elements. And we are seeing it evolving right now. In 2011, we started with the question of isolation and energy efficiency. Currently, within the Build Up Skills program, we are addressing energy efficiency, isolation, bio-based materials, circularity, digitization, climate adaptation, resilience. We are working on just and fair transition. So there are a multitude of waves, you can say, that are together combining into that big, huge wave. And that's why we need transition skills for entrepreneurs, for politicians. Because when you are creating the big wave, it, we are living in the universe, so energy goes into the wave. And that means that on other aspects, energy will go into the wave. And in order to sustain and to accelerate the transition, we need not only the carrot, the stick, and the music, but I think we need a DG for decline. We have to choose what to do not anymore so we can free up capacity to do the new things that matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was... Uh...
for the introductory statements. Um, I, on my side, I heard very many interesting, um, and I had a, heard a reconfirmation of uh, a number of, uh, of uh, points and challenges and potential uh, opportunities that, that we have recently and over the last, let's say, maybe half a year to a year discussed. And as one of our panelists observed, it, it's really fantastic to see the topic of skills making itself more forcefully or more prominently on the clean, clean energy transition agenda. Because um, I have the impression that this is something that has been happening for not more than a year or, or two years in a, in a, in a very concrete uh, manner. Now, the skill development challenges, we've heard about the structural fragmentation in the sector. Um, we've heard about the, the relative um, yeah, unattractiveness uh, of, of many of, of those traits uh, due to uh, including temporary employment models. We've heard about uh, a divergence in the perceptions uh, on on those traits by 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 societies by 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 different nations, we've heard about the the role of uh, vocational uh, education training and how it does or it should, or how it does not or how it should uh, keep up with existing demand. Um, and we've heard uh, some very good points also on on mobility uh, and uh, of skilled uh, workers. So. Um, I think we will move uh, it shortly to Slido, but uh, if, I, if I can uh, take the privilege of, of maybe posing the first question. Now, um, I, I retain that we need to attract, to retain, and to reskill a big number of, of people um, by coordinating all governance levels and most notably the national, where the competencies are, and, and the regional and local. We need to start with the gap analysis, and here I want to open a, a, a yeah, parenthesis. Uh, if you want, this is this is not something new. We have done, um, or member states have done skills analysis through uh, the skilled roadmaps under the Build Up uh, Skills Project. Uh, they have uh, done an analysis. Uh, through the long-term renovation strategies uh, under the existing energy performance of buildings directive that will be asked to do this again uh, through the uh, building renovation plans uh, in the upcoming uh, energy performance of buildings uh, revision, directive revision. So there is a lot of gap analysis going on on what kind of skills are missing where. Now, uh, one point that I also uh, made is the need to update curricula. How can we approach this? The need to get the image of the construction sec sector and to align um, vocational uh, education and, and, uh, and training as well as to uh, move more forcefully on branding. So I would like to take the opportunity to, to ask the panelists, operationally, what do you see as, as the next logical step on one or more of those um, items, or, or any other that you, you may feel I have uh, un, undeservedly missed. If anyone wants to take the floor on this one. Yeah, please, go ahead. I take the floor because in seven minutes I have to leave. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so, we have heard about the problems of micro-enterprises. Um, the, the point is that um, micro-enterprises and even SMEs often do not really know what skills they will need in the future. So that for sure they will need help locally, of course, regionally, not from the commission, from people, chamber or trade association um, on site. That, that is for sure. And then when it comes to um, training and the problem of full employment in Austria, what a luxury, <laughs> or full order books, this is already at company level, or a company that is understaffed because they do not get enough people, and then they might have people that are not enough skilled. These are the people that um, want to pass training the least. Th that th those that need training most, they, they, are, not, they are least motivated. So, what can be done there? It was already mentioned, short, you, you said it, uh, short-term training. And there are indeed uh, member states 
um, now have a recommendation to um, create a legislative framework to put in place micro-credentials, micro-certificates, if you wish, for short training periods, because if the training periods are short, the likelihood that people do training, I mentioned the reasons already, why not, um, is, is uh, clearly considerably increasing. So um, let's say one solution is in sight. Yeah? And, but in the meantime, um, in many sectors, um, on, on the national regional level, they already start to establish micro credentials. In fact, uh, they, they, um, they are quicker than their, their, their own nation state, but they go ahead. So that also shows this huge increase of use of uh, micro credentials shows that this is something that sectors have been waiting for. Please, uh, you can contradict me, but I think that's true. Um, um, and then <clears throat> image, yes. Uh, Fernando, you must be, become a more positive person because I heard, <laughs> I heard you, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. <laughs> I, I come and I come to that and I come, you, you yourself, you said you have to change the narrative. Mm -hmm. And then I was thinking, yeah, well, okay, nice. Everybody has already seen a port. Everybody has already seen a factory. Everybody has seen a construction site. But that does not mean that people know about the jobs that are there. And there are many jobs on the same side at the same time. But this, the people often do not know. So what you have to do is to make occupations, individual occupations, visible. And that leads me to professional orientation. Uh, you have to get the young when they are young, meaning um, maybe already in school, 12 years old or something, uh, to re reach out to the young ones and showing them these individual interesting occupations. Um, either you do it with structures um, in the region, yeah, there are professional orientation services, but you can also do it uh, as a sector, locally, regionally, yourself. I know an example from the Netherlands, uh, from the region of Leuwarden, where, they, uh, the, where the water treatment, water sector in general is very strong. Um, and there they developed uh, presentations, even games for pupils in school. And the um, last um, remark on, on, on vocational education and training, yes, the, the picture is, uh, is, is very mixed. Uh, um, depending on the member state. Uh, there we, since 10 years, we have the European Alliance for Apprenticeships. It's also an alliance for work-based learning, not only apprenticeships. So we try to promote it. Uh, member states also try hard, but it's, it's a cultural issue. But uh, if member states put the legislative framework in place for apprenticeship, this is already one step. If they then also give social partners a structural role in the um, regime, uh, so to say, uh, I'm making the, 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 the word, um, for vocational education and training, that is the second very good step. Because if we look at countries like the Netherlands, Denmark, Germany, Austria, and Finland, uh, what um, makes the system better is that the social partners, so the people who know the labor market best, they are in charge of vocational education uh, and training. And then it's combined with work-based learning, either apprenticeship but, or super equipment in the schools. And mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, things can indeed uh, be done. Curricular change is also an issue, of course, to adapt. Um, Curricular change, again, if social partners are in charge of the VET system, uh, then, curricula and then curricula can be changed quicker uh, than if it is uh, centralized, right? Centralized in a ministry. It depends, of course. If you're lucky. The, if you're lucky. Yeah, okay, yeah, I admit it depends how, uh, let's say, the culture of cooperation is. If, if, Social partner relationship is conflictual in a country, um, then of course, um, yeah, we have a little problem. Also with that, what I said before, it's true. That, that is also a necessary social partner, uh, a good um, 
real social partner partnership that is not so conflictual but compromising. Um, yes, in transition, sometimes you have also to compromise. <laughs> yes, uh, there, so, yeah, and that uh, shortens the, 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 and then, of course, autonomy of vocational education and training institutions is a national competence, but in those countries who, where schools, fed schools have more autonomy, they can also uh, change curricula quicker. So now a lot to, uh, but I have to leave. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any reactions from the, yeah, Christine and then uh, Fernando, please. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you. Can you please, uh, no, yeah. only one microphone at the time. So uh, Felix, can you? Yeah. 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 Thank you very much, Felix. Just yeah. uh, so, uh, just no, now yours is not, yeah. Yes. Now it's on. No, no, it works. So uh, how to attract people, it's like, as we discussed this before, but we didn't uh, because we have just <laughs> met. Um, indeed, uh, what can we do to make people make the, this attractive to young people? Uh, first, maybe before that, I would like to say, uh, sometimes if you follow this debate, if I were someone here in the room, again, this is, we're not talking about rocket science. This is what you just said. The knowledge is there. Uh, there are millions, thousands of people who know. Sometimes if you're not from the sector, you think, oh, installing a heat pump, it's like launching a Mars mission. It's not, it's done 10,000, 100,000 times. And maybe if you are far away from the reality, you think this is, com yes, of course, you need to know some things as you need to know many other things. So maybe we can also start by demystifying this whole um, discussion. So this would be my first request. Um, uh, the second is uh, indeed, this is one of the hardest nuts. I would say how to attract people to the sector in a, not only my country, uh, where everyone is competing for young people. I think that will be full employment or not, that is a fact everywhere. Um, so what we have, we have developed, it's a small program, it's a bucket in, it's a drop in the bucket, but nevertheless, we've developed a program where we go into schools for the 13 year olds because this is quite a decisive moment. Also responding to our realization, we saw the climate activists this morning, like on any uh, important conference, you have to have climate activists, so we had them here. Uh, otherwise, you're irrelevant, I guess. <laughs> and if you ask this, uh, when you see your future job, probably they would not say planning heat pumps or doing full thermal renovations. So we have all to work together to show that if you are climate conscious and, and interested, what are your actual job perspectives? Maybe they think they will work in a cool startup doing, I don't know, cups for whatever, because that's part of their daily life, so cool recycled bags or something. So we, we have a program where we go in schools and um, have uh, developed a um, relatively cool game, uh, and in the end, they learn about different professions in the energy transition. And one of them is a heating installer, and one of them is a PV installer. Uh, and suddenly, this is something cool. Um, so I think if I ask something from the commission, <laughs> uh, because member states and regions are not here on these panels, regions except for me, I think that is to put in in some document uh, and money to make a real campaign, but not the campaign where you give money to some marketing agency and then they do three spots. I'm not talking about this. But a true um, uh, activation of a wider consensus to show that actually working in the energy transition, be it, and this is also part of our initiative, being on a vocational training level, and as you say, this is not what you want your child to be. I don't want to work my child on the construction site. Uh, this is, uh, but you can be, have super cool jobs, uh, work installing PV panels or heat pumps or bioenergy boilers. Um, or if you are more interested into marketing, you can market the energy transition because also that uh, is something we face here up to, of course, the obvious engineering. Professions. So if we can see something uh, 
financially, also on an awareness level, that addresses these making, uh, we, in German we call it Berufswunsch Energiewende, so job aspiration energy transition. Um, something like this uh, would maybe also help in addition to the, the sticks and the carrots. Thank you very much, Christiane. Um, in order for you not to leave with a gloomy image from EBC, if I understood well, uh, now I'm going to share with you more positive thoughts about indeed things that, that um, we have been trying to do through our network or that we have seen as uh, proving interesting, positive. Uh, one of those that I would keep in order to link to the EPBD, even though it's not a polemical debate anymore, is about one-stop shops for energy efficiency. So um, I guess that uh, you, you're familiar with the concept. Uh, why I will mention this now, because we, we need also to change a bit the culture um, at, at the local level um, in a way that we provide one spot where people can, that people can address to in order to understand for clients, potential clients, for citizens to understand what they can do, how they can do it. Uh, also, indeed, to provide them with more knowledge about how they can be helped financially, technically, to do so. Uh, and that will create, uh, um, let's say, a, a, yes, a hub of ideas um, that also reflect the needs of the local community, because this is very e important, and we're very happy that in the EPBD it seems that it has been taken on board, and that we're going to increasingly uh, make use of these local um, chapters of information. Uh, but then I'll, I'll go back to what we do uh, in EBC, in our network. Yes, schools are one of the primary targets of our members at national level, because you mentioned uh, reaching to kids of 13 years old. I think there is indeed a lot of information that should be provided provided at a very young age in order to already, as we were saying, narrative, uh, talking about the narrative, to tell them that indeed there are cool jobs or jobs that might become very cool because of technology evolving. Um, so uh, recently, um, certain of our members have been targeting the generation Generation Z, uh, trying to work with influencers. Yes, we have to. This is something that is uh, trending in order to catch the attention of the younger people in order to showcase how certain young ambassadors are dealing uh, with, let's say, the more traditional part of the work and bridging the gap with, uh, with innovation. But schools is cool, young people is cool, but let's not forget the trainers, the teachers, because they are a key actor that also need to be trained and prove that there, there are interesting um, outcomes in construction industry for the youth to, to whom they're, they're, they're teaching. Um, something that is increasingly uh, interesting and that we are trying to, to discuss further is to help traditional construction SMEs to better brand what they're doing. Uh, something that I like to say is that circularity, for example, is not a new concept. Circularity is very old. It's people trying to make the most of the resources they have. This is something my grandmother was, grandmother mm -hmm. was doing, and even before so. So, OK, this is something that has been there. So, OK, we understand better use of resources. And certain of the traditional crafts um, Let's take an example: uh, a painting company um, that was that is using bio-based paint uh, for ever and ever because that's their market, their niche market. Understood two, three years ago that the fact that the paint is bio-based will attract people to the company. Why? Because now the awareness about the environmental responsibility is there. So also helping construction companies to better brand what they're doing, how they're doing the products, materials that they're using is, is relevant. Um, something also that I, I, I think needs uh, a mention, even though it was um, touched upon already, yes, migration is a taboo topic that at some point will need a proper conversation because we need the people. This is 100% clear. But also let's also talk about other underrepresented people in construction, one of those being women. We know that 10% of uh, the construction workforce is 10% is women, but women that are active, let's say, not in on, on-site jobs, but more what you were mentioning, marketing, uh, logistics planning, uh, helping with communication, etc. But again, trades are evolving. Uh, we're talking about BIM. We're talking about um, installation, indeed, of renewables. Those are things that could be also appealing to 
female uh, colleagues because indeed, even though it, it was the sad reality to say that the tasks were uh, require a certain level of strength or a several, certain level of, of uh, let's say, yeah, physical strength. Now it is increasingly less so, and this is something that we also need. For me personally, and for EBC, believe us, having only 10% of women interested in working in construction is not something that is sustainable, um, because at least with the digitalization and then another issue we have is that, yes, digitalization, everyone is aware of digitalization of construction. There is a lot of innovation, but this information doesn't come to construction companies, doesn't come uh, to potential uh, future female talent in construction, doesn't come to schools. So we also need to bridge the gap between all the innovation that might be happening and those people that are putting their hands at work. Thank you very much. Please, Jan. Yes, what I would like to add to the discussion is that we do not need to focus on a specific target group. We have to address society because society is involved in the transition and everybody in society has to be involved in this transition. Because if we have a fully trained heat pump installer doing retrofits with heat pumps, for example, in the social housing sector, and the lady taking the phone at the housing sector does not know what the heat pump is, then things go wrong. And that means that everybody involved in society needs to know what the clean transition is and how we can live it together. And then you can also see that the demand will change, but also the entrepreneurs can change their business model because they want to behave not only as an entrepreneur, they want to behave as humans, as part of society. And what I see happening currently in the Netherlands, and I'm very happy with that, at the neighborhood level, we see that there is a lot of talent that is not used for the energy transition. And by fostering those talents, they are helping each other in the neighborhood to start up in the transition by forming, so yeah, you can call it the band of service, to ride together the wave of transition. And I think focusing is not smart. Please make it a societal issue and make sure that everybody is involved. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, maybe the moment has come to see if we have any questions on Slido, do we? Okay, so, um, shall I read for everyone in the room or, yeah, can we have back the questions on the screen? Yeah, so, anonymous, a lot of statements focus on electrified heating and buildings via heat pumps is the same amount of resources going into upskilling regarding rooftop solar. Um, I'll, I'll read maybe all four and then we see whether this can be grouped um, one way or another. If we are short in skilled workers, is there much potential for citizens to transform the building infrastructure themselves with guidance from skilled experts? So the do-it-yourself type of approach. Um, then. A next question, how ready is micro companies skill set already developed to implement sustainable energy solutions instead of gas boilers? 20% are ready, 50%. Um, okay, uh, so the preparedness of micro companies to move to um, sustainable energy solutions, uh, an estimate. And what about training people directly at the construction sites or on, on, on site training, not in classrooms? Um, would, do we have volunteers for any of those questions? I, I think they're not, they're really um, quite different, all of them quite interesting. So um, you can pick one or I can take yeah, maybe some of, this, of the more technical, so related to the technologies. Um, on the um, so first of all, install, if you're looking at installers, organizations, uh, installers of heating systems, organizations, they are, as we have said, mostly small 
um, a micro size, so that is the whole, you know, the, the whole topology is like this. Um, and we estimated that half of them need to be reskilled, particularly for heat pumps installations and hybrid heat pumps, um, digitalization, and so on. So that means that probably half of them is ready um, because heat pumps is not a technology that we are installed since yesterday, but it's, it's already been there uh, for some time. But uh, there's still quite a lot to do. Um, on the, uh, there was another one. Yes, as far as we are concerned, again, as, as manufacturers, we uh, are, so there is hardly any heat pump manufacturer. There are heating systems manufacturers. So manufacturers that do all heating systems, including solar. Um, and increasingly, uh, we're looking at installing not a product, but a system, because it's a system uh, that provides heating, space heating, water heating, that is uh, increasingly connected into the house uh, with the solar system, with uh, you know solar PV, for photovoltaics. Uh, increasingly in building, there's going to be, there is, and there's going to be um, also uh, you know, a system to plug in your electric vehicle, so that all building starts to be looking a bit different in terms of energy management. And so we give trainings in all of those technologies, not just on heat pumps. Therefore, also on solar, uh, solar thermal, and in some cases, or in, even in many cases, also solar PV, because that's a technology that we see also growing with the, quite some potential uh, alongside the increased electrification. So all of this, of course, uh, makes, makes it so that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a complex, it's not just, uh, you know, it's the heating systems are not a plug-in, you know, technology. But of course, uh, it's it's uh, both in our interest that people that installers know how to do them. So we have an interest in, in pushing for uh, trainings of all types uh, that include all the technologies because we know that all, you know heating is a local issue. Every building will be different, and so the the installers is actually a problem solver. It's not just somebody that plugs in stuff. He needs to look at your house and see what works, what doesn't work, your, your piping, your electricity system, and so we'll figure out what best works in your building, for your building, and therefore he needs to know a number of technologies and, and the interaction between them. And therefore, the digitalization part is more and more interesting because he will need, through that, he will need to uh, yeah, make, make the whole system work efficiently for your house. I think that's it for the questions on the technology. Thank you very much, Federica. I, I retain the, the problem solver uh, in the context of heating system, and I, I, I do agree, and I, I think that's really, um, that is a, a spin that maybe we should use more broadly. Um, we are talking very often about energy system engineers, if you want, but uh, I think it's much uh, more hands-on uh, reference to problem solvers uh, when it comes to, uh, to heating or, or really uh, your, your system at home a and how it interacts, uh, yeah, I mean, even beyond the heating system, how, how your, uh, the energy needs of your uh, building uh, are, are calculated in view of sizing your equipment rightly, uh, in view of, yeah, of not oversizing it, because uh, for gas boilers, yeah, it has happened in some countries systematically. For heat pumps, it's much more expensive and uh, uh, rather be avoided. So um, um, problem solvers of the um, maybe building uh, industrial ecosystem or home ecosystem. Uh, Thank you. Some of the other questions. Do we have uh, takers? Can we yeah, have again? Um, Christiane? I can be the spoiler about the do-it-yourself system. OK. Uh, <laughs> uh, we had a solar thermal do-it-yourself movement in Austria in the 80s and 90s. Uh, which was in a way successful that it paved the way for professional systems. Hmm. It was a, I mean, a solar thermal collector is one of the simplest renewable hmm. energy you can get. Um, it can also do all kinds of bad things to your buildings, but <laughs> over time, the risk 
uh, is limited with a PV. Uh, frankly, as Federica was just saying, nowadays we speak about whole systems in the buildings. Um, and indeed, many manufacturers do have plug-in system to make the installer's lives easier. But nevertheless, I agree, it has to work in the specific buildings. So I would hesitate to say this is a good answer for complex technologies like uh, heating systems, PV, there is electricity. Electricity can be dangerous. <laughs> um, we tend to forget this because we are so well, well protected by our regulations. So um, I would rather attract the people in the do-it-yourself to uh, be inspired by cool new technologies. Uh, this is something that does work for people. That, OK, saying this uh, bioenergy boiler, these heat pumps, it costs a lot. But it's also a cool new technology. So this, this works well for us. So this is, I'm afraid, I, I don't see it. Uh, the second is the micro company question. Uh, I was wondering, uh, with all the data that were mentioned, is it the number of companies or is it the number of people working in the sector? Yeah, you see? So a large company, maybe one company, but may have hundreds of staff. So here, again, I would not underestimate many of the existing installers. Indeed, if you are one or two persons, this is a problem. But we see quite a lot of good uh, installers with 5, 10, 15. We also have, of course, a number with, that grew to 50, 100, 200, that then can do all the things that larger companies can do. So also to give a perspective, and for the one person, we still have a lot of one person installers. I don't think it's a sustainable business model to re remain a one person. Either you grow, and they, this person has to do everything from the offer to the installation to the repair to the maintenance. I don't think this is a sustainable uh, business model. But I would be very interested to know uh, because it's quite an easy killer argument to say, all these companies are also small, they cannot go to training. Um, if you look at the number of persons working in the sector, maybe the picture is a little bit different. Um, so that would be an interesting thing. And the last point is on training on construction sites. This is actually what the apprenticeship system does. You are trained on the job by someone who has to have the training to train you. This is the cool thing about an apprenticeship system that actually, if you learn to be a hairdresser, to stay in a very simple, uh, you will cut your first hair with some, standing someone next to you. Or if you learn to be a heating installer, after, in our case, one, one year, you're allowed first to touch the heating system. And in one and a half years, you're allowed to touch uh, the piping. And by year three, you can do it yourself, together with the school education. So these were some responses. Thank you, Christiane. Can we maybe have back the questions? So I um Yeah, I, maybe that, I think um, that's a half a question, half a, a statement. How important is it to, to send a trigger to the construction sector that you will need to have these skills before or by 2030? For example, via building and product policies. Um, and I believe there was another one at some stage that was more or less the same. Well, maybe I, I take the liberty of, of reacting. Obviously, very important, and this is what we are doing uh, uh, a little bit across the board uh, through our uh, sectoral um, yeah, clean energy transition through, through, our, uh, through the energy performance of building directive, but also uh, via the uh, renewable energies directive, the energy efficiency directive, all have uh, certain aspects of, uh, that, that point to the, to the skills, not of the future. These are really the, the skills of, uh, of the present uh, and, and the need for, for those. Uh, so yeah, but very important. And um, but um, yeah, the the the, the regulatory um, 
indication is, is out there. Uh, so um, the next step is really for, for the sector to, to integrate those uh, in a yeah, more um, structural, in a more structural manner. Um, if, can I just add to that? Because I think we've talked before, but the element of demand there uh, is very important. So if nobody's asking, why am I whistling here? If nobody's ask, ah, you have it on. Oh, sorry, oh, <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, if you don't have the demand for the product, for the system, for the transformation, and then then it's going to be very difficult for the supply to to happen. So we can of course train as many people as we want, and firstly we need to address the scale. Um, but I think it's important to 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 not just tell the construction industry uh, or workers that they're going to need new skills, but that we make sure that those that are demanding are actually demanding it, so that we ourselves ask, okay, the installer can still let, let's call the installer and see what we have at home and, uh, and ask him, oh, but I've heard about heat pumps, for example, I've heard about solar. Uh, you know, can you install it? Because, you know, it's, it's, if it doesn't come from anywhere, then, you know, they will just uh, keep installing the same things they've been installing before. And people do then listen. We have run uh, a, a survey of uh, people that have bought, that bought their heating systems in the previous five years. And uh, we asked how much they relied on the uh, counseling recommendation of an installer and it turns out that 96% of those people have followed uh, the advice of the installers either 100% or you know to a large extent so this intermediary here is is very important and people listen if people start also calling for for something new this will be a lever I think for change yeah, I, um, just uh, hold on for a second, Jan. I just wanted to also, uh, we have three more minutes, but I, I wanted to take one of those to react and then I give you the floor and then we can wrap up. I think that we do have the demand because in a number of markets that I, I know, uh, there are long waiting lists for virtually any type of, uh, um, well, heat pump installers for sure, but also any um, other type of, of craftsmen. And we've heard uh, during a stakeholder consultation event uh, on the heat pump action plan dealing with skills, we heard about the burnout of installers. So I do, I do believe that we do have really shooting through the roof demand, maybe not equally, well, obviously not equally the same uh, throughout the EU, but in, in a number of countries. So. Um, yeah, uh, but yeah, I, I do take your point that uh, that the business will evolve uh, in in view of meeting demand and and no, not uh, in in a vacuum. Please, Jan. Yeah, I would like to add to, to that. 2030 is 6.5 years ahead of us, and what we see is we have demand. What we saw in 2013 in the Build-Up Skills Initiative is that it will take five to eight years to build up enough capacity to cover the demand that is raising. And the demand will raise in the coming years in an accelerating speed. And that means that if we want to have competent companies, construction, installation, but also smartification companies that are connecting the grid properly to avoid disbalances in the grid. We need to start tomorrow with creating an abundancy of properly skilled workers. And that means that we also need to create for the micro companies, so to say, a room where they can learn to surf or to swim or whatever, but that takes time. On average, we see that since 2011, every company that started to change their business model to become a sustainable installer, it took three years for them to change the internal primary process, to change the marketing, to change the communication, to change the client support, to change the digital means they need. So if we want to be realizing the goals in 2030, at 50% of the renovation wave, for example, then we should have started three years before today. So acceleration is urgent. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, that is uh, 
uh, a message of, of really urgency of uh, advancing uh, and, and more forcefully engaging uh, on uh, on the on the skills uh, agenda in clean energy transition. We've heard really fantastic operational uh, ideas and and ways forward on uh, making short term training uh, and and making best use of micro credentials. Uh, making individual occupations visible, getting hold of young people when they're young, uh, through professional occupational service, through apprenticeships, uh, while being mindful, uh, obviously, of the of the cultural um, specificities and orientations that 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 are not obviously the same across uh, uh, across the EU, but working with, with social partners in view of really advancing the uh, vocational, educational and training um, agenda, uh, de demystifying the, the discussion on what skills for what and when, um, Re working with, with young people, again, this comes uh, over and over, uh, and getting a true campaign uh, to, to show the coolness of working in clean energy transition. I admit I have started this. My, my son, uh, who is graduating from school, uh, is very climate-oriented, um, yeah, and I told him, become an engineer. This is what you do if you want to change the world. Um, also, uh, getting to acknowledge that uh, a hub of ideas that that reflects the needs of local communities are um, are can be a potential um, uh, powerful tool, and and really getting to understand how Generation Z work and how we can get them on board uh, in 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 big numbers, as well as uh, not. Forgetting us, the previous generations, the pre-generation Z generations, so the trainers, teachers, and, and all the rest of us um, uh, also acknowledge that trades are evolving and there is a uh, space, uh, an increasing space for women in, in those uh, crafts. And uh, with this, I would like to, to thank very much our panel, and I would like to invite you to, to, thank, me, uh, to thank them uh, for, for their uh, vision, their interesting ideas, and their openness uh, to, to, the to this discussion. Thank you for um, for being present today. Please uh, do follow. I believe in uh, the next session in this room from 4:30. Uh, no, upstairs uh, is also on skills. I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> what should I say? Uh, is also on skills on build up skills, practical approach to skills upstairs 4:30. And please do follow uh, the rest of the Sustainable Energy Week, which offers a richness of debates on the topic of um, uh, smaller bills and greater skills. <laughs> Thank you.